let's go back four months, like uh, uh, in April when you took the GMAT and you saw this amazing score of 770 flashing <laughs> on your screen. Now, this is a scorecard of yours, I know, but on the screen, when you saw that 770, what was the first feeling that you had? Let's, 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 let's go back a bit. When I saw the score 770, actually, I was already well prepared for it. I was assuming my score to be around 750. But these 20 points came as a surprise to me because in the mock test, I was scoring around 750, 760. And just one time I scored around 770. So, like, this was the highest score which I achieved, like, for my mocks. That, that's great to know. In fact, I was checking your GMATWIS account as well uh, before our call. And if I get it right, the last two marks of GMAT is you scored a 740 and 750. Uh, and, and, and generally, generally when you score a 750 on GMAT with marks, like the general variance that we see is that students end up scoring 10 to 20 points more than what you score on GMAT with because our verbal is, is actually more challenging than the actual GMAT is. Uh, and in and, and your last mark, I think when you scored a 750 in GMAT, you scored a 50 and a 39 or 40, one of the two. So 15 point is exactly what you got in your actual GMAT. And, in verbal, you scored uh, 44, which is an amazing, amazing score. So this is uh, uh, really, really good to know that uh, you're able to perform really well on the test. Yeah. So let's talk about the strategy. I know 770 is a dream score for many students. You just said, okay, uh, you know what, I was surprised. But honestly, if I were a child, I would pinch myself. And say, okay, is, is, it, is it real? Like, is, is 770 the score that I've actually <laughs> gotten? Because it's something it's less than one percent of people mm -hmm. like less than 0.25 percent people get in the entire year so that's a very very amazing school so i'm sure those of you who are going to watch this video want tips from month of it. so how we are going to structure this is basically we'll break down month of this journey we prepare for mm -hmm. gmat for about a couple of months we yeah. break it down into three broad phases where we'll talk about the first phase of his prep for the first one month in what did we do? How did we learn all the things around GMAT? Then we'll go to the last next 15 days and the next 15 days where we'll talk about fine tuning the weak areas and the mock strategy as well for month of year. So let's start with the first phase month. Ago. Like, how did you start your prep? Like, what was the first thing that you did? How did you create a study plan? Let's run us through that in, in as detail as possible, basically. Uh, initially, I was I wasn't able to look up for much sources. I started with the official guides and I uh, and I was just randomly scrolling on the net and just seeing what are the question types. But then I think I came across the GMAT with advertisement, I think, on Instagram. So mm -hmm. they from there I took a mock. I took a free session. I think it was for two to three days. So mm -hmm. I took a few courses on that and I found it to be pretty good. And mm -hmm. after that, I decided to enroll for it. So mm -hmm. I took a three months plan for the GMAT Wiz. So after that, yeah, I was basically preparing from the GMAT Wiz, and apart from that, doing doing seven hundred level questions on the GMAT Club. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So and when you were prepared, yeah. yeah, please please go ahead. I think you are uh, expanding on the thought. Yeah, and uh, for the study plan part, uh, initially for the first two, three weeks, I followed the exact GMAT with study plan. But after that, I tweaked it a bit and took classes which were according to my convenience. Like when I felt like doing quant, I took some quant classes. And when I felt like doing verbal, I did. Uh, okay, so let's deep dive into the first two, three weeks. I know like after two, three weeks, you have to do fine tuning and focus more on your weaker areas as well. So in this two, three weeks, uh, you mentioned that you followed the exact study plan with GMAT with you. Now, uh, trust me, when we were creating this GMAT this product, if I go back in time, like we used to think that, okay, we are gonna create a revolution in the industry by creating uh, something amazing using AI where students don't have to worry about their study plan. They will get the study plan on their own. And uh, after we rolled out the product and a lot of our students got success, uh, the great thing is that when I ask them, okay, what did you do in the first one month or like two weeks, three weeks of your prep, they just say, I just used the GMAT with study plan. But that kind of uh, sometimes also makes me feel that, okay, it takes away the effort that we had put in to design the entire thing. It makes it look very simple, right? You just have to follow a study plan. But when you don't have a plan in place, let's say, for example, before you started working with GMAT, before you saw the advertisement on Instagram, 
how was your preparation looking like at that stage compared to when you started using the Zoomatrix platform? What was the difference that you saw in, in your uh, focus, in your attention, in your strategy, in your like overall prep? Yeah, so before that, uh, it was like pretty much random. Like I didn't know what to do and how exactly to prepare for the GMAT. But with the GMAT, it was, I think the main plus point has been that it has provided a structure to my preparation. Because otherwise my preparation was going all around and it was haywire. I didn't know what exactly to do. I had, I, I was also reading one Manhattan book, but like what I'm saying, uh, reading a book, I think, doesn't make much sense when you can get the whole course and that too on your laptop, which provides you with much more, much more good rigor and, uh, and you know, a good structure to your study plan. It's easier to retain, basically, when you learn in a video format. And then when you do those quizzes, you get to see the scores as well. Because in a book, when you're solving questions, you're probably uh, like just getting to know, okay, these many questions have gotten correct out of these many that were there. But when you're taking a quiz on the platform, like EMAPWIS, you get to see your percentage scores, you get to see your difficulty levels, your performance in each area. Uh, and that kind of makes you understand all of that. And and um, I'm not sure if you were looking at the board also, Mantave, but there, when you see the performance, the predicted score uh, on, yeah, on the screen I was as well. At that, yeah. uh, uh, like how 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 was that overall predicted score moving, and did it give you any motivation that you're moving in the right direction? Yeah, actually, when I started with it, I think the first few uh, classes I had a pretty strong hold on them, like especially in the quant. Mm -hmm. So initially, my predicted score was like like it was like around seven eighty. But then okay. after I gradually progressed with the course, it came down to 750. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and uh, after ending the verbal, I think in the sentence, after the sentence correction part, it was around 740, what I remember. Mm -hmm. And, but then after giving the mock test, it's again started going up. And after doing the few more questions on the GMAT, uh, on the, uh, on the GMAT, I think I, I cannot remember that name, GMAT. Club? Viz? No, 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 no. Like, where you, wherein you can customize your own quizzes. Okay, the, on the GMAT Viz platform. Basically. Yeah. Yeah, so that is Viz quiz. Basically. Yeah, Viz quiz, yeah. <laughs> yeah, on the Viz quiz, uh, when I started doing a few more questions, my SERP score again started to go up. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So that prediction always helps because many times yeah. when I speak to people who are new to the GMAT journey, their question is, you know what, I've I've been preparing for three months. I feel that I'm there, but I'm still not there. But when I ask them, okay, what did what do you think is your current skill score or the projected score? They don't have an idea, like generally, because they're just using random questions to solve. They're not getting a proper path. So when you see that progress happening and you see basically your scores drop, dropping also, sometimes you kind of get the motivation to pull it back up. So mm. those things also happen when you see the validation that definitely helps. Okay, so so let's talk about the study plan a bit, Mantove. So in the study plan, like what was your, like what was given to students? Again, you are a GMAT student, you probably know what was there in the study plan. Those of uh, many people who are watching this may not be GMAT -based student. So, what exactly was there in the study plan? Basically, like, was it just a list of activities, or uh, basically you have to complete this or that, or was it a proper planned uh, thing which you used to adapt as well as you move forward? Like, how was the study plan basically that you were following? Yeah. So, first of all, GMAT was allows you to customize your study plan. Like during the start, it asked me like, "What do you want to proceed with quant first or with verbal?" Mm -hmm. And after, on the basis of your on the basis of your score in the quizzes, uh, it adds a few courses or removes a few of them. So that is again a very big help. Of course, I even even after scoring a good score in the quizzes i i wasn't removing the videos which okay. were not required for me because like it was still for yeah, my so, uh, uh, but yeah but on that part uh, uh, in the during the on the topics in which you got a few wrong questions mm -hmm. watching a small clips of that particular topic again was a great help in solidifying the concepts just okay. after giving the quiz after completing a particular chapter Okay. okay. So basically what you're saying is that when you're going through the coursework, 
if there were any gaps in your understanding, the platform used to serve you small, short clips, uh, basically focused on those gaps yeah. that helped you revise them and then put into practice yeah. so that you are comfortable. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, so basically, in the beginning, you mentioned that you started with quant, or you were working on both quant as well as verbal. Like, how was your strategy? Yeah. So initially, uh, like for quant particularly, I think that. That in the GMAT exam, I think more work is required on the verbal part because for the verbal questions, one is not prepared. But I think the quant is like basically maths from tenth level, tenth level, and a few, a few concepts like probability and permutation and combinations from eleventh. So basically, since I am a doctor and a med currently a medical school student, so I think on the quant part, I guess uh, the I'm the much. I think I paid a lot of attention on concepts like permutations and combinations because, like, mm -hmm. I I had didn't have these, so I I hadn't studied these topics during my eleventh and twelfth. So okay. that was the part I think which was lagging in quant. But yeah, as GMAT, but I think GMAT was videos are enough to prepare to prepare these concepts as well as of course the other topics as well. And coming to the verbal part, I think verbal is what requires much more attention than quant mm -hmm. because um, because the uh, topics are totally new, like critical reasoning and uh, reading, and even the reading comprehension. It is like a much more like you have to de develop insights while mm -hmm. reading a particular passage, and then only you are able to answer the questions. I think. Reading comprehension is a lot more practice than just watching mm -hmm. videos. Yeah, yeah, reading comprehension, in my opinion, is a culmination of what you do in SC and SCR. So it's basically, as you said rightly, that it is more about practice because there's no concept over there. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to just put your learnings into the right place. Mm -hmm. So, so I'll go back to quant uh, a bit because a lot of doctors uh, speak to me, and and I, I remember this discussion I was having uh, I guess a month back uh, with another uh, prospective student who was a doctor, and he was like having a quant phobia. He was saying, okay, you know what? I I think quant is something which I can't do well on. So, uh, so what are your thoughts on that month? I mean, like, is quant doable for people from non maths background as well? Like, is it tough? Is it yeah, of course it's doable, like because as I told you, like most of the concepts are from class ten only. And a few concepts like probability and permutation and combinations are from eleventh. So I think it is doable. And even in even during your tenth, you get a glimpse of concepts like P and Cs and probability. Yeah. So I think it's not a. Uh, not it's a not like they're testing on heavy PNC questions either. So at the end of the day, it's a test of logic. And I, I just wanted to record this on video uh, so that people who are from medical background hear it from the horses mouth. Someone who has actually uh, <laughs> been there, done it, and is that. So it, it's at the end of the day pure logic. And trust me, if someone can crack uh, MBBS or doctorate in India, they can definitely crack GMAT con. So it's not yeah. that tough. Yeah. It's not that tough. It just requires patience and structured thought process like Manta did. So, uh, so great to hear from you on that part, Manta <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about verbal a bit uh, now. So in verbal, you mentioned that RC is the like the most complex area. It's slightly different. But did you start your prep with RC like in verbal, or did you start with sentence correction and CR and then RC? Like, how was the approach that you followed? Um, like in I like I like personally for the first two weeks I followed the exact plan by the GMAT uh GMAT whiz. But then afterwards um uh, I like I tweaked my plan a bit. So like like during the first two weeks I was preparing sentence correction and then after two weeks I started doing a few things simultaneously because like I had a very short span of time to pre prepare for the GMAT. I uh so I think I started taking more courses in the areas which I, which I felt were lagging for me. So I think reading comprehension was one such area, but but I think one should only do the reading comprehension course from the GMAT course after he has already finished the critical reasoning course, because mm -hmm. I think the critical reason after the critical reasoning course you develop a you develop a skill in which you read for the deeper meaning of you know, whatever is written in the passage. So, uh, so yeah, so we, uh, so initially I did sentence correction, but then I watched a few videos of reading comprehension, but, but when after that I tried 
doing the practice practice passages mm-hmm. like it was pretty bad so then i jumped right over to mm-hmm. critical reasoning and then mm-hmm. after a lot of especially the questions in the arts like arts and humanities Humanity. questions were bothering me because i had zero background in that like in the science passages were doable and even the social science ones so yeah i think the best tip for uh, reading comprehension is that you should focus on those passages in which you have zero to none background mm-hmm. because during that you develop a new skill because like in the science passages there there was always a thing which i knew preemptively without even reading the passage so, so that is easy for you to relate to kind of the information yeah. which is provided yeah so if if you want to like develop your reading skills i think you should better focus on uh, passages from humanities and arts right so matter a very very good point that you made like, i'll just try to structure the thought that you had for the users that are watching this so mantav they started the sentence correction then jumped on to rc but when he started faltering on rc he realized that he has to do critical reasoning and when he did critical reasoning he understood a very very important skill which is to look for the deep meaning so probably what mantav they meant by deep meaning is what is written behind the scene behind between the lines basically not just written what is written on the text you have to understand what's going on in the author's mind that is a skill that you develop basically through critical reasoning that is a skill that helps you in relating multiple pieces of information together so am, am i right one thing exactly yeah, 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 exactly. okay and that is something which helped in rc so in general like when we designed the platform of gmatis we had this thought process in mind that in in verbal there are three skills that are tested so will be skill number 1 which is the understanding of meaning from sentence correction will still be skill number 2 which is inference or analytical reasoning how to develop the understanding of context which is what you are talking about in cr and in rc we will apply all these skills together and teach you what the what is the main idea over there so it is th- that that way it is important to go through in that structure especially for first time test takers uh, like mantra there so it's very important that you go through in that order so great mantra way that you you actually skipped but at least you realized that you have to do yeah. critical reasoning and it in that way okay so let's move on to the second phase of your work we understand that like you go went to the study plan focused on what it was giving you made a few tweaks to it then uh, made changes according to your gaps but once you are done with the course work like i assume you're doing you're you're done about uh, 75 80% of your course as i was checking on the platform approximately so after doing that course work how did you go about fine tuning let's say you talked about risk quiz as well that you were taking quizzes over there you talked about gmat club but what was your approach in fine tuning how did you identify your weak areas how did you focus on them so yeah uh, coming to that i think uh, after like doing my course work around 80% i think i started with doing uh, 700 level questions on the gmat club okay so doing those questions helped me identify my gap areas much more because a few questions in the gmat club have a very very high difficulty as compared to the official uh, as compared to the official guide questions or the official gmat mock test questions so uh, during that time i realized a few gaps and to fill in those gaps i used to read online about them and even will sometimes go back to the lectures which were uh, already present on the gmat wiz platform mm-hmm. so from there i find it but also simultaneously after like nearly completing my course i started doing mock tests like okay. both on the gmat wiz platform and on the uh, on the mba.com gmat uh, gmat official, official test platform. yeah so uh so i think the g i think the official gmat tests are much easier which are available mm-hmm. on the nba.com as compared to as compared to other actual tests from uh, from the g uh, from the actual actually i think actual gmat and the official tests are nearly the same uh, they have the same difficulty level, but i think gmat tests are slightly difficult a yeah. slightly difficult i think quant is a bit more difficult and i found sentence correction to be a bit easier on the gmat quiz and and uh, critical reasoning and quant to be much more difficult so yeah generally the feedback that we get is rc is much more difficult so that's that's the general range because even when i was looking at your account 
uh, you had scored about 80 percentile in SC, 90 percentile in CR, and 70 percentile in RC. And that's that's the general story. People who get 70 percentile in RC in GMAT to score actually end up getting a 90 percentile in their actual GMAT. And mm. you did not need to order the ESR, but since you have scored a verbal 44, I'm just telling you from my experience, yeah. a verbal 44 means your average percentile in all three combined is 90 plus. Average is 90 plus. And then most likely all three are 90 plus, basically. <laughs> so even though you don't realize this, you might feel that CR is more difficult, but actually RC was the uh, most challenging area. That's how we yeah, say like- That's uh, what I'm saying. Like I practice RC a lot. Like I started reading a few articles from all daily and like particularly those articles which are focused on humanities and mm -hmm. art. So I think that helped me prepare a lot. But I think sentence correction was the part which was lagging for me the most amongst these three. Uh, uh, critical reasoning, reading comprehension, and sentence correction. I mean, sentence correction was a bit was more... not as natural, basically. For yeah, me as it required a lot of, like, a lot of ratta and a lot of effort. <laughs> like, even <laughs> after, even after, like... Uh, studying like properly and getting hold of the sentence structures, but I think like some some of some of the sentences which required the use of idioms like it is not cons it is just considered to consider myself as but not considered mm -hmm. to be. So I think that requires a lot of memorization to get mm -hmm. hold of the idioms. But I think that only comes over time and like. In, even in the GMAT exam, there are hardly one or two questions out of all, I think, for, yeah, out of all the questions. So I think you can even skip that part and look for other flaws in the sentences. Exactly. exactly. And that this is the, so you, you actually stole what I was going to say next. So uh, we actually did independent research on this. So how important are idioms? And we found that there are only 3% questions in the entire GMAT where idiom is the only error. As you said, that there are always secondary errors as well. So 3% basically means if you are taking 30 questions, you are going to get less than one question maximum. And in GMAT, there are 12 questions in SC with a score. Obviously, there are two more unscored questions as well. Uh, so, so in SC, like how important was you to learn the meaning-based network? Many people say that, okay, you know what, you can just look at the splits in the sentence, meaning is not as critical. Like what is, what is your take on that matter? Yeah, so for the meaning based approach in the sentence correction, I think, uh, like, uh, I think it is very good to develop a solid understanding of the sentence structure and to get your questions right. But at the same time, I think that, like, in the GMAT exam, you cannot afford to spend a lot of time, uh, in yeah, sentence so correction stand, questions. Mm -hmm. So, like, my approach was again a mix of the two approaches. Like, I use the meaning based approach as well as I scanned the, uh, you know, scanned all the options of the uh, questions. So, like, uh, I, I, I used to eliminate, like, like uh, like there are five choices so i used to eliminate mm -hmm. around three three choices like two to three choices were always uh easily eliminated like based mm -hmm. on just scanning Not and it. minor easy very easy to spot errors like any mm -hmm. modifier or any singular plural error mm -hmm. so but after that the last two choices were the most tough to eliminate i think that's where the meaning based approach comes okay. into play because I think like using the meaning based approach alone will take a lot of time because I used to struggle a lot on, I used to take a lot of time on critical reasoning to get the questions okay. right. So okay. like reading comprehension was pretty quick for me after a certain point of time, but so I couldn't afford to take a lot of time reading each and every uh, mm -hmm. sentence on the sentence correction and uh, eliminate by the meaning based approach. So. I used to come down to the last two or three options and then use a meaning based approach to find the correct answer. And perfect, perfect point. In fact, uh, I would like to just build upon it a bit. Uh, so let me ask you a question. So when you are going through the coursework, when I see coursework, I mean the initial two, three weeks, am I right? In, I would I be right in saying that when you are going through the coursework, you are focused solely on the meaning based approach. You learn the meaning based approach, apply it solely. And when you gain confidence in that, you realize that, okay, this is where I can actually mix up the vertical scanning with the meaning 
and this is where i need to focus on the meaning is that what happened or was it the mix yeah. from the beginning itself yeah because like when doing the quizzes on uh, the gmat this platform i used to practice with the meaning based approach but when i started giving the mock test like i think in the first mock test which i give on the gmat quiz i i my uh, like i i wasn't able to complete the test like i wasn't able to complete the verbal section in time i think i had somewhere around 6 690 660 uh, second mark it was 690 then 7 then uh, 740 yeah so i wasn't able to complete it so then i realized that i cannot take this much time on sentence correction and then i started looking up for other things and like i only use the mean then after that i think meaning based approach is is best used in critical reasoning and because in critical reasoning you have to uh, do it like this only otherwise you will just mess up the answer and uh, and uh, af- and so yeah so after like uh, taking a lot of time in sentence correction questions i uh, i saw a few more things i saw a few more videos online and a few more articles i don't know what not so then i started That's like i, I use mix of both approaches like a few like i think a few courses or few websites were advocating only scanning so mm-hmm. i kind of mixed both the approaches and find found out what worked best that's actually one of the the way we learn things See, the idea is like whenever you have to learn a shortcut let's say content content as an example okay so when we apply or when we try to learn a shortcut we have to first learn the logical method yeah. of solving the problem Yeah, Because exactly. when you learn the logical method, you automatically understand that these are the steps that you can actually skip, and that's when you actually come to a shortcut. Yeah. If you try yeah. directly learning a shortcut, it yeah, will then that won't work. Yeah, that yeah. that doesn't work. Because like even if you try doing that, you you will be stuck on the last two to three options, and it will be a very hard time eliminating yeah. the last last two to three. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So just for those who are watching this video, a very important point. Please note it down if you want to in your notebook. Don't try to over-optimize your timing in sentence correction from day one. Because I speak to so many students, and I'll just tell you about one of the guys I was talking to. He spent two weeks, two weeks on the platform, did the entire sentence correction coursework, and his score was still low, like around fifty percent IELTS. We had a call as a mentorship call daily, which we did. And I asked him a few questions, and we got to realize that he did not use the meaning based approach from day one, simply because he felt it would take him too long a time to kind of do it. And I had to then explain him the same thing that it takes time to first learn that, and then you can use shortcuts as well along with it. So in the end, he ended up wasting those two weeks. I had to ask him to repeat a significant part of the course work again. So mm-hmm. this is very very important learning that uh, that matters a lot. Okay. i think yeah. even like even you when also you start doing reading comprehensions and more critical reasoning questions i think like each of these three topics are interlinked like if you if you start getting better in the reading comprehension then you'll naturally get better in critical reasoning and sentence correction like the same goes for the other two as well like if you are good at critical reasoning you will be able to tackle many rc questions easily and even you will be you will become better at the meaning based approach uh, in sentence correction ah, so that's right because see, at the end of the day in verbal the answer is right there in the question set so it's all about you understanding the concept if you understand the context well you are able to answer it it's not like quant that you have to remember a formula and you have to apply a formula that's the only thing which is there in xc but in everywhere else it is just about you understanding the context correctly If you understand the context, you get the answer. Right? So that's a that's a very well said. Man, so we're at all three of the island. Okay. Uh, so last thing now, let's uh, like we're getting close to the end of this uh, interview now. I I know people want to hear more from you about your 770 journey, but because of limited time, let's focus now on your mock strategy. So you mentioned that you were taking mocks after completing the course. So yeah. was there a certain time period or gap that you were having between the mocks, basically? uh actually like i start actually uh, to be honest i didn't have much gap because as i told you like i i prepared in a rush since the deadlines for the deferred mba were in april so mm-hmm. and i had even i had made up my mind to go for an mba after mba in i think january and yeah so my preparation for the mocks was like uh, i i started giving my mocks in march only uh, i think in the 
uh, initial like in the first week of march so my first test was like pretty horrible because <laughs> because i wasn't able to complete the verbal section in time so then you improve your sentence correction so, strategies so, yeah because i was taking around 2 2 3 minutes in sentence correction only so i think this was a key pointer and and what i want to tell everyone is that you shouldn't wait uh, for your preparation to complete before starting with the mocks you should start giving the mocks simultaneously like when you're done through the majority of the course because that gives you enough time to focus on your weak points more and then gradually while i developed speed with the sentence correction questions again i started giving mocks i think the mocks i had given the mocks around on 2 to 3 day gap only not much more than that because i was easily able to identify like what things were lacking lacking and majorly the problem was with speed only like in the verbal section in the initial mocks the problem was with speed only so after that and um, after a few mocks i uh, also i also started to give the official uh, gmat prep mocks so during those like those tests seem seem to be pretty easy after giving the gmat quiz mm-hmm. because those are much uh, they are much easier mm-hmm. i think than the gmat quiz mock test so during that time i i think i scored uh, i think i scored above 750 in both of them despite despite only scoring 750 once in the gmat quiz mock test so i think gmat like if you are able to get a, get a score above 720 30 i think you will be able to score 750 in the official test so yeah so after so fair point that you are taking about 2 3 days gap between the mock test this is very important many people what they do is they just take one mock test and then another mock test but you are taking 2 3 days gaps and you are expanding your week you know analyzing them working on them first so that you see an improvement in the score and that's why All your GMAT score marks have actually gone up. Like I don't see a single mark where your score has gone down. Like it was on a uh, in- increasing trajectory all the time, and that's what is very very critical for those who are watching this video. It is important to analyze the mark, spend that time, work on your weaknesses. Just by taking another mark test is not going to magically improve your score, because just like you felt, na mantave that your issue is speed. Many people think my issue is speed, so all I have to do is is just do things faster, and they will just take another mark test. Praying to God that somehow their score improves, but that doesn't happen. You have to do something to improve your score. That's mm-hmm. very critical. Like one should like uh like one should firstly analyze and get told like where where he or she is lagging, like whether it is in verbal or in quant. Like mm-hmm. for quant, I think a few questions were pretty, very tough, and I think and I still think that those questions aren't solvable in the actual <laughs> exam. Like given the time, like oh, a few happens. mutation combination and a few probability questions. Like I don't think they are like one can. You have to skip them. Those are you have to be intelligent in skipping uh, those. Letting go, go. Like, those. like during my GMAT, like in the actual GMAT also, like there was one question. There was one question which was very long. I like even. I uh, like I had around fifteen minutes left on the uh on the oh. one section and but and I had only five questions so okay. but but still I skipped that question because I had already spent around five minutes on it but oh. it was oh, that, that five question, minutes on the question <laughs> that that question was pretty long and there are a few questions like even in the team at ways like there are one or two questions like in which i see the solution i'm like yaar ye to cbse mein 10 mark ka rata question ye ek minute mein karne ko de rahe hain there are sensitivity level questions you cannot get all the questions you cannot get all the questions yeah you will you will get two three questions on that a sensitivity level like those basically it's just that a few are from your comfort area so you will be able to still solve them But a few will come from a uncomfortable area. For example, PNC was a comfort area for me. You give me a very difficult question in PNC, also I can still wrap it up in two and a half minutes max. You give me a geometry question, then I will be like, okay, I can't do this. <laughs> so, so those, those things are true. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, apart from that, I think one has to be like smart enough to when one should know when to attempt the question or when to skip the like if or. Question like seems really, really, really tough, and it is out of your comfort zone, and you are also lagging time. It's better to like just come out and just <laughs> proceed ahead with what you are able to solve. 
Yeah. Great. So once of the uh, closing remarks, my last two questions. First one is any tips basically for students who are working with like I know you have given a lot of tips, but just to summarize, uh, let's say if you want to talk about the top three things that our students should keep in mind to score a seven seventy, what to improve three things? Um, like one is to to analyze your mock tests and. And simultaneously, you shouldn't be afraid to give the mock test because I've seen like many people have this, uh, have this phobia. Like once they will finish the course, then only they will start giving the mock test. So I think this both these things should go hand in hand. And the next tip, uh, would be to uh to work on your weaker areas and like especially. If, uh, for the reading comprehension, like I, I had a lot of issues in the humanity yeah. and arts passages, so I think you should focus Expose on yourself more to those topics. Read more on those topics. outside your area of interest, because like these, I think I, I, I don't even read novels. So, and I have a very, <laughs> <Same> I, <laughs> have, I have a very, I have very less knowledge of you know arts humanities and there are so many passages based on american history also so i don't know like that only comes after time like like to be honest like i did so many questions uh, which were based on humanities and i don't know the gmat club like like in a few like i like only by by doing the passages i had developed like what what had actually happened in american history like just by doing this passage i had an idea like what what are, what I, I think that's the hidden agenda of GMAT to educate people. <laughs> 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 yeah. So that's and true. Like, as per our research, around 35% questions in GMAT are based on American history. That's the number. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think lastly would be to. Just one tip, I'll, I'll just add a, to a point to your second tip, Manchester. So if anyone is struggling with humanities topics, I have a very good book that you can read to that. I just want to recommend that. Uh, it's uh, by this uh, by Will Duran. The name of the book is The Story of Philosophy. The Story of Philosophy. You can get it from Amazon, and it's a book around how philosophers thought, basically. So different schools of thought are there. So this is something which is will will help you become comfortable. Second, the language of the book is so dense, so dense, and so convoluted that it will help you like relating to a lot of 700 level passages, which are also very dense and convoluted. So you'll actually learn. How to demystify the context of complex sentences. Just, so just the uh, recommendations on my side. So, yeah, sorry for interrupting, my yeah, yeah. yeah, and the last tip uh, would be to to manage your time effectively in the test. Like you should know when to when to go for the when to try solving the question and when not to. Like sometimes, like some. Quant questions are so tough that, and if you are lagging time, you shouldn't even like bother like attempting those. Like, and yeah, and one more tip to add is like in the data sufficiency question, I think uh, these questions seem trickier on the surface, but like if, when you go a bit deeper, there's always a trick to these questions. So, for the data sufficiency question, you shouldn't be afraid to answer those, but for the problem solving questions, which look very tough, I think you should. You should still you should skip those, but you should always try doing data sufficiency questions because they are very they're pretty quick to solve. Yeah. If you if you are able to find out if you are able to uh, understand what is in yeah. because in PS you still have to solve the question. So it takes a lot of time to calculate yeah. the answer in PS time. PS that is faster. Mm -hmm. So anyone who wants to basically learn about more timing strategy related advice, uh, I'm going to attach a basically webinar link on the top right corner of this video. So you guys can basically check out later on as well. Uh, so my like last question, Mantavya, uh, what is the review of the GMAT list course? So you have checked the course. Uh, uh, what what do you like about the course? What will you say to other students about the course? Yeah, uh, for the GMAT I think firstly it provides a structure to your preparation. And the second thing which I like the most about the GMAT is it uh, after like after you do a few quizzes, like just after finishing a topic, it uh, it suggests you a few videos which you which you should watch again to uh, solidify your weak concepts. 
and yeah and coming to the mock test i think the mock tests are are uh, are much more difficult than the actual exam so i think if you are able to do well in these mock tests you will be able to score well in the exam great great answer it was great hearing from you I'm sure this video is gonna get a lot of likes on YouTube channel and everything. So, uh, all the best from my side uh, for your applications. Uh, we did speak about a few of them, and uh, we're gonna speak about it after the video recording is ended as well. But yeah, it was great having you here today and uh, sharing yeah. your best experience with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.